<laughs> you thought just because February was over, I wasn't going to keep playing these games while you're wrong. What's going on, YouTube? Welcome back to the Dragon's Den. I'm Rukari. This is Minotaur Hotel, and we were supposed to make a choice. You know, there's a weight on my shoulders, and the flames demand an answer. Do I want... A classy, scenic, but strict hotel, or a fun and rowdy, perhaps even horny hotel. Now listen, I don't know if you know me, but I don't need, I don't need horny. I don't need horny. Horny is not in my life goals. I like a classy place. I just, I need something nice, respectable, calm, and please, for the love of God, keep your genitals out of my face. As you make your choice, a sense of finality descends, as if you had broken a seal, or perhaps signed a contract. I got too many contracts, I needed to be the other person. You are pulled out of your meditation. Asterion looks as well to the fire, unfazed by what happened. I was afraid I'd be locked in there forever. It kept coming back to me. Was this the fate of the gods? Were they locked away somewhere, stuck and forgotten? Is that why they disappeared? I mean, they did do that to the Titans, their parents, so it would kind of be a poetic justice if the same thing happened to them. Just spitball in here, really none of the Greek gods are good in any way, as I've said before. So, you know, they, they kind of deserve it. If only I could disobey Master Clement's orders, I would have rammed that door down on the very same day he threw me in. But I couldn't. I cannot disobey the Master. Neither can I disobey you. For all those years I thought and thought and thought... There was nothing else I could do. My body was rotting away. I thought about all that could happen. Every little possibility. I wish I could tell you that I dreamed. And indeed, I allowed, at times I allowed myself to hope. But more often than not, I thought about all the bad that could come next. Every possibility. It is difficult for me to believe I am free. At times, I catch myself thinking that this must be one of my daydreams. I was certain you'd send me out to the foreman, and it would all turn into a nightmare. My stomach was turning. I sat down because I couldn't stay up. Oh. <sighs> Poor guy. When you return, you are greeted with a new sight, a rebuilt lounge, an afternoon sun outside, and an entirely different Asterion. Ah, oh, you're back to mostly normal. You still got that one eye problem. I'm, hopefully that'll heal soon. But it's not a dream. We are here. I just want to get back to my life, my hotel, my guests. Voices bouncing down the hallways, food and drink for all, listening to their stories well into the night. At times I would sneak out during the night while Master Jean-Marie slept. Outside I'd meet up with a friend, a mathematician from the New World. And we talked on and on about infinity, about the hotel's architecture. We'd bring wine and get way too drunk and rowdy. Then the kitchen staff joined us, and later the nighttime receptionist. We'd hang out by the kitchen's back door, outside, with a radio blaring from inside. We'd listen to the French songs all night long. I'd summon cigarettes for them. I didn't smoke myself, but I'd return reeking of tobacco. I'd always have to take a bath before Master woke up. And in turn, they'd ask Master Jean-Marie to put me in their cruise. And I'd just not do much, just enjoy their company. Spending a day with friends, talking, laughing, not a care in the world. It was life. I woke up every day knowing my existence had meaning. I had a purpose. It was all that I had. And that fiend took it from me. It was like a dream. 
It was as if, as if all my past had never happened, and I could live a fantasy of doing something good. Each and every day was a marvel. It was good and kept me from the nightmares. It didn't matter if the masters treated me well or not because they were not my life. I had friends and a reason to be. I wasn't the Minotaur from Crete or some tortured prisoner. I was a Sterian, that's all. And chances were they didn't know what got me put here in the first place. But the dream had to come to an end. It just had to. I died once, in Crete, and again when Clement kicked out my guests. All my other deaths, tortured by masters from centuries ago, were small compared to those. It isn't fair. I am a monster, I know my crimes, but what did my guests do? Nothing to deserve being kicked out of their home. We had veterans recovering from shell shock, soldiers still healing from their wounds, refugees from the fronts. We built a purpose for this place, no thanks to the gods, and that selfish fiend destroyed it. Oh. I get it too, like this is such, uh, it's such a powerful metaphor for isolation too, and like, oh, this poor baby, he just wants the life he never had. Oh, I love him so much. He's so precious and he deserves only the good things in the world. I am sorry. I forget my place when I drink, master. This won't happen again. It was awfully out of place. It's fine, though. I gave you permission to speak freely with me, didn't I? And I meant it. If you were bothering me, I'd have told you to stop already. So you can relax. I suppose I want to learn more about what you went through. I want to help. <sighs> Baby! You just need head pats and hugs. I can only assume times have changed. You are not like the other masters. I'd have been put into my place for this insolence by now. I keep thinking this will all end at any moment now. And that I'll wake up back in that room. Asterion's gaze wanders, and it seems that only now he realizes the vast change in the lounge. The hotel is alive again. But it's not a dream. You'll see. It may take a while for you to believe me, but it's true. And I meant what I said. I want to be a good master to the hotel and to you. Asterion's eye shifts away, then back to you. The minotaur bites his lip. The smallest sigh escapes his lips followed by him closing his eye. The side of his face wrinkles. He is about to say something. His face goes cold in a nearly professional solemnity, but he stops himself again. One last time he looks at you. I am sure that Master will. His lips, trum his lips tremble for a moment before a smile cracks his face. His voice comes out twisted. The curve of his smile gives his words a tinge of warmth, but his words come out shaken. His voice cracks and the Minotaur enunciates slowly. There is also an undercurrent of anxiety as his eye shifts to and fro. I am glad that of all the people there are, you are here, Master Rukari. He looks down, then back to you. Something seems to flash in front of his eyes, which takes away his attention. He sinks in thought. And it's as if he's entertaining an idea. Whatever it is that takes his mind seems hopeful. He bites his lips, his lips in want and continues to lose himself in wanting to believe. The smile conquers his face first and spreads out to his whole body. This time his voice comes out firmer amidst his smile. Then I repeat my vows. If you are set on caring for the hotel and its guests and fulfilling its man-made mission, then I will serve you out of my own will. It will be a pleasure to serve you, Master Rukari. There is much about which we should, about which I would enjoy talking with you. Could I perhaps persuade you to enjoy a drink? I'm still a lightweight, but sure. 
I'm actually not that much of a lightweight, I just don't like drinking that much. You nod and tell Asterion about your favorite drinks. The details of what you say seem to wash over Asterion. He doesn't nod or react as you describe the drink. Instead, his face is taken by languid joy. Asterion goes behind the new lounge's counter. His hands caress the wood, feeling its smooth, almost sensual texture. <laughs> Stay away from the counter, boy! He nods without looking at you. Now I can assure you, I'll make something quite extraordinary. He says while caressing his beloved hotel. The Venturer looks at the bottles on the wall. You don't recognize any of the labels, even if you can guess their contents. It would seem these are all in-house productions. Asterion, however, seems at home. His gaze wanders for only a moment before it gains a knowledgeable tinge. He selects the necessary bottles and sets out to make your drink. He starts by washing a cup. It already shone when the Minotaur picked it up from the counter, as if it had just been polished for its first use, but he insists on doing it. The water is on, and there is even a fresh bar of soap near the sink. It's as if the entire place had just been tidied up by a disciplined cleaning crew. Are we gonna get to run the hotel soon? Because that's actually the part of this game I've been looking forward to the most. <laughs> the Minotaur holds on to his smile, eyes half closed, as he runs his fingers on the glassware and all the equipment he will use. He takes his sweet time becoming acquainted with the new environment, then pouring your drink. At times he shows a bit of clumsiness, no doubt a consequence of downing an entire bottle of wine. The Syrian gingerly slides the cup to you on top of a napkin. He finally looks back to your eyes, acknowledging your existence. His voice comes out with the slightest inflection of a smile. I am not quite there yet. I will get better still. Just need some more practice to polish up back to my old self. I rarely ever manage the lounge. I am acquainted with it, of course, but there were always better bartenders around. But I enjoy it. So soothing. The precision that goes with mixing drinks. It's a whole profession now. You can be your own mixologist. Asterion lays his forearm on the counter and supports his weight on it. His tail swishes lazily behind him. I wasn't ever the best cook, either. I do well enough to please the master, you will see, but working in the kitchen requires agility. I could spend ten minutes chopping a single tomato, making sure all the pieces were the same size. Master Jean-Marie had me do exactly that a few times. Cooking is a very intimate thing, master. Back when Master Jean-Marie was alive, my shifts helping the kitchen staff would amount to, at most, standing in a corner, chopping a few onions per hour. Working with my hands is very relaxing, even if I'm not terribly dexterous. It may surprise you, but I only learned to cook how to measure ingredients, read recipes, season food, just a few centuries ago. No one taught me how, back in Crete. And when I was in the labyrinth, I didn't have much to cook with. Father would send food shipments. No matter. It is improper of me to unload something like that on anyone, let alone master. Happier subjects abound. No, talk to me! You need to talk about your problems if you're ever going to work through them. Maybe this is a prison of your own guilt, and the only way you can work past it is by facing your demons and overcoming them. The Minotaur turns back and picks out a bottle of wine. It is different from the previous bottles you found. It, had a, it has a minimalistic label and a more modern shape. Asterion gives you a quick, pensive glance before opening the bottle and taking a long swig from it. What do you talk about next? Uh... I don't know. What do we talk about? Um... What, what was life like in Crete? I'm gonna dig into your past and you're not gonna love it, but we might as well start. Life back in Crete? Now that... My memory is hazy, to say the least. It's been so long I'm not sure if what I remember is even correct. But... Crete was quite the power back then. That was before Athens gained traction. I was raised in the palace of Knossos. It was an immense, sprawling building, perhaps the greatest the world had ever seen at the time. It, I had many siblings. We played when I was allowed to. I couldn't leave the palace often, but I used to sneak out with my brothers to go hunting wild goats. I was swift-footed. My hooves helped me cross Crete's hard, volcanic soil. I had a mother and a father like any other child. <clears throat> my mother's name was Pasiphae. 
She... In retrospect, I realized she wasn't all there. In the head, I mean. I didn't quite understand it back then, but I don't think she liked seeing me. I reminded her of what she had done, and of her reputation. My adopted fa adoptive father was King Minos. Assuming I wasn't misbehaving, he treated me well, for the most part, because I was sacred. Hmm. Then I got sent to the labyrinth. I don't remember how old I was then, maybe twelve or so. My sister, Aridene, convinced father. She said I would become dangerous. It took a while, but he was swayed. I was carted off and left with only an axe to fend for myself. In that labyrinth built by the artisan Daedalus. That's what life was like. That's what life for me was like in Crete. Isn't it curious how we hold on to memories of childhood? I've existed for thousands of years now. I died young before my 20th birthday. And yet so much of who I am comes from those two decades. I often wonder what life would have been like were I not a hybrid monster. For starters, mother wouldn't have lost her mind. My sisters wouldn't have tried convincing father to send me off. I would have had a normal childhood. Make no mistake, life back then was not easy, and dying young was not out of the ordinary. A land like Crete had to keep itself armed, too. Had I been born fully human, I could have died young by disease, or in early adulthood in combat. Still, that would have been preferable to what I went through. Had I not been sent off to the labyrinth, the gods would not have sentenced me for my cowardice. I'd still be in Hades, in the Asphodel Meadows, where I was supposed to be. Hades. Perhaps Master wished for me to tell happy memories of Crete. I do have a few. Quite a few. But I have far more from Hades. I was welcome there, as all souls are. Of course, I was no hero and would never see the Elysian Fields. That's where heroes went to. But the Asphodel Meadows, where regular souls were sentenced to, was quite pleasant. I even had a job there. The god of the underworld picked me to take part in the border patrol. It was a simple enough duty, patrolling the frontier to catch souls attempting to escape. I shared housing with a cousin. I never even knew I had a cousin until then. His name was Geryon, and we had a lot in common. The god of the underworld, Lord Hades himself, took a liking to me. We'd often trained together, and he taught me the underworld's fighting style. You see, that's one thing that people don't get, is that a lot of times we tend to paint Hades as the bad guy, if you're looking at, like, Disney movies and stuff, but he really wasn't disliked. He was the... He was... Not the god of death, but the god of the land of the dead. He was just the person responsible for watching over departed souls and figuring out where they went based on the way they, their deeds in life. Now, if you're looking for gods of death specifically, you're looking more along the lines of, like, Thanatos. And even then, Thanatos isn't necessarily a bad god. He's just a god with a job to do. And when you're looking at people like Hades and Thanatos, more often than not, they're a hell of a lot nicer than, like, the above-ground gods, the, the Olympians, who tend to kind of be assholes when it comes to humanity. Death, for the most part, is just a peaceful escape unless you were, like, truly an awful person. Asarian looks down to the counter and drums his fingers on it, lost in thought. I was a good patrolman. I wouldn't have minded staying there. That's about it, I suppose. Does Master have any other questions? Uh, you... What's your favorite memory? My... My favorite memory? Now that's a tough question. Asterion drinks more of his wine, then rubs his hand against the counter. He sighs, looks to you, then looks back down again for a few times. Very hard question, but I think I know. There was a master, Sir Bernard. He was the Labyrinth's Lord for a few decades and then passed it down to his son, Sir Robert. 
When Sir Bernard was on his deathbed, his son transferred ownership of the hotel back to him for a day. As the, hard, as the hotel's returning master, Sir Bernard wrote and signed a, a contract. Except it was just a letter to me, thanking me for everything. Sir Robert took over again, of course, and he prepared me something too. I had helped raise him, you see, and he gathered all his childhood drawings of me and signed them as a contract as well. Contracts are everlasting, unless they're ex unless explicitly revoked, so their contracts would last forever. They can't be burned or torn apart. Nothing will destroy them. That is my dearest memory. Robert and Bernard's gift to me. The contracts, they are everlasting. But I know Clement tore apart the ledger where we kept them. They must be hidden away somewhere. Eventually, I'll find them again, even if it takes me years. After all, I have all the time in the world, don't I? The Minotaur takes yet another swig of his wine. He sways left and right, his eyes half closed. I have another memory, just as sweet. When I was in the Underworld, I made friends. One of them gifted me with a statue of a red ox. He was a herder in life. It was fitting, of course. I brought it with me to this place, the only thing I managed to bring. It was supposed to be in my room, but again, Clement. I was loved. The letters and the statue, I cherished them deeply. But love needs no gift to be remembered. Asterion looks down again. He holds the wine bottle against his chest. Is there something else Master would like to know? What are your favorite foods? What do you like to eat? My favorite food? Master should not worry about that. I eat the leftovers. Anything will do for me. And it's not like I can die from starvation. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, but surely there are things you prefer or foods you won't eat? Any allergies? Come on, I just want you to have a good time. Well, if Master truly wishes to know, I don't. I'd rather not eat beef, and I have not for thousands of years now. It would be cannibalism. So, it's usually poultry and fish for me, or... Well, I did hunt wild goats with my brothers back in Crete. I liked it a lot. It's one of my favorite foods by far. I didn't get to eat meat often when I was a child. It was a luxury of sorts, and the shipments to the labyrinth rarely had any. It would wa rot on the way, so they didn't even try. Goat aside. For the longest time, oats were the best I could get. Even today, I have a liking for porridge. And I have a sweet tooth. I always liked fruit and honey, even as a kid. But back in 1940, there were so many options. Master Jean-Marie insisted from the start of his mandate that we needed French pastries daily. Traditional baguettes, croissants, and pain au chocolat for breakfast with jam. Macarons every Sunday and tarts after lunch. Making a traditional baguette is no simple matter. I spent many months trying to make a single one which pleased his palate. He allowed me to eat the less leftovers every once in a while. Just the thought makes me salivate. I'm so glad. He doesn't finish the thought. Asterion keeps his eyes fixed on you, his ears and tail flicking lazily. Let me introduce you to chocolate, my friend, and candy bars, and cupcakes, and pie. Alrighty, if there's anything else I need to know, there is but one question. What did you do for fun? So I'm curious, before Master Clement came along, what did you do for fun here? For fun? I suppose I've had a number of leisure activities over the ages, ever since the hotel was built at least. I didn't always have the means, but I've been an avid reader for a while. Mind you, I come from a time long, long before the printing press. I learned to read the Cretan language from my brothers by writing and reading letters in the sand. There was no paper during those times, and stories were recited from memory. 
Even today, the hotel can't manifest books. We still depend on receiving shipments from the outside world. But when the master saw fit to gift me some, I always enjoyed reading material. I will buy you all the books in the world. You can have my collection. I've got hundreds in bookshelves. They don't all fit in the bookshelves because I have too many books, but I'll give you books. <laughs> Poetry mainly, but how can I put it? I am curious about how the world outside is doing. I can never see it for myself, but when I read the stories, I can imagine. I often wondered how different reality is from what I have imagined, and how much it has changed. Master Jean-Marie insisted I read The Hunchback of Notre Dame. He even showed me a few drawings of the cathedral, which he drew himself from memory. But I do wonder, what must it feel like to be there? How haunting must it be? I've never been in a church. I died long before Christ, but the guests have told me all about them. Stained glass windows, tall, mighty pillars, the arches. One's voice echoes all the way to the entrance and the wooden benches. I wonder what Notre Dame de Paris must look like today. What it must feel like to walk alone through it, seeing all the statues of the apostles. Sad news, it kind of started burning down a little while ago. Like, you honestly probably don't want to know that much about the real world. It's kind of in shambles sometimes. You remember a few details about Notre Dame de Paris from your art studies. Oh, hey, I get... Okay, this is where my, my degree finally comes in handy. I can tell you about Notre Dame in depth. Yeah, it must be quite the atmosphere. The cathedral has a lot of reverb, like old Greek amphithe amphitheaters did. If you speak up, you'll hear it for the next four seconds. I'm sure it's haunting if you are hearing it live, but in a recording, it'd just be echo. It meant that the music composers made for that space was simple and floaty. Oh, it meant that the music composers made for that space was simple and floaty, and it took a long time to change gears. I guess ancient music was like that too. Did full chords sound weird to you when you first heard them? I assume the music you grew up with was mostly monophonic. <laughs> Why, yes. I spent quite a while without listening to songs, and when I did get reacquainted with music, it all sounded very alien to me. If Master Jean Marie was big on the cathedral, I can think of some songs I could show you. They are between monophony and polyphony. Would you like that? It's not the same as being in Notre Dame de Paris, but you might enjoy it. I yes, absolutely. I would love to, Master. I'll try to remember to get you more books, too, since you're such an avid reader. I would greatly appreciate that as well. Books are my... my escape, I suppose, from reality, from this reality. Sometimes I'd even dream about what I was reading. That was a mercy like no other. Same, bro, same. Books are better than the real world. Heck, this is better than my reality, but I mean, you know, it's... It's not great for you, so sorry, I'll move on. There are very few things better than a good book. Although that hardly counts as my main pastime, since books have always been so scarce. My liar has been my dear friend for centuries now. Master can guess that I must be awfully rusty after all those years locked away. Still, as soon as I've brushed up on my skills and tuned it, it would be a pleasure to play it for my master. As I said, I also enjoy spending time with the guests. Who doesn't like being around friends? But... I suppose for me it's different. It makes me feel normal. As normal as a minotaur can be, which isn't much. I didn't always tell them about my past. The master is entitled to know, of course. And a few of them were informed. But only those I chose. More often than not, I didn't want them to know. It only got in the way. It was already difficult enough making friends and it opened a series of questions I'd rather not answer every day. Asterion bites his lip and sighs. There is one thing I greatly enjoyed, but it hardly counts as a leisure activity, and I wouldn't want to bother Master by rambling on. Come on! Go on, just tell me, what was it? Well, if Master truly wishes to know... A few masters who inherited the hotel had children of their own. More often than not, they were guests themselves before acquiring the deed, so they knew me well enough. I helped with raising the children, 
They were a joy, each and every one of them. Even the unruly ones, I might add. Ow, oh, he just wants to be a dad. It usually took a while for them to warm up to me. I know I can be scary, even for an adult, let alone a child. I can only imagine what must have gone through your mind when you saw me in the cold room. I suppose I should be thankful you did not abandon me right then and there. Anyway, the younger ones, if they happened to arrive at the hotel early enough, they were quicker to get used to me. Some would even say I was cute. I mean, yeah, you're just like a big cow. They thought having a minotaur friend was fun, playing with my horns, petting me. I'd even, I'd even give them rides on my back. I was the fun babysitter, you could say. A handful of them even grew up to become masters themselves, inheriting the deed from their parents. Now that was a joy, serving the children I helped raise. I was very proud of them, who they became of who they became. The hotel had a special significance to them. It was a home like no other place could ever be. The hotel attracts those who are lost. Many of those children had no place to return to. Some had lost their countries entirely. That was a long time ago. I wonder if any of their descendants still live. Life only exists for a short while. I once knew a god. He told me that a human lifespan is like the blink of an eye to them. We're akin to pets. Father used to tell me not to grow attached to dogs, for they lived short lives. That is how they see mortals. But the thing of it is, the thing you have to really think about is, for one, yes, get attached to your pets, but for two, their life may be short to you, but you are that animal's whole life. And you should make it a good one, because that's all they're ever going to know. And something that loves that much deserves to be loved for that entire time. Anyways, moving on before I make myself sad. It's not the same for me. I may have died already, but I experienced time like any other person would. Indeed, life exists only for a short while, but it's long enough to be enjoyed. Better not to think too much about those matters. What else? I enjoy exercise. I wasn't much of a fighter at heart, but I was trained for it. I was taught to always remain sharp. Speaking frankly, I cannot wait to have some exercise. Not tonight, perhaps. It's still too soon, but the day will come. Uh, what else? What else did I enjoy? Music! I played the lyre, yes, but the radio. Oh, that was very nice. Master Jean-Marie made sure I listened to all the French singers. Humanity truly is wonderful. The gods and the mythical creatures, they are set in stone and hardly ever change. They were made to be eternal. But humans change so much. And I'm glad to be at least half human. I dearly enjoy the inventions humankind have come up with over the centuries. I can't wait to learn about all what learn bleh, bleh, bleh. Forget that line, which it's with again. I can't wait to learn about all I messed it up again! <laughs> I can't wait to learn all about what's changed. Anything else Master would like to know? I've run out of questions, so no. When the conversation naturally exhausts itself, you both let Nersha carry you into a comfortable silence. The warm buzz of alcohol in your system does much to ease the day's drudgery, as does the newly rekindled, rekindled hearth fire's con con convivial crackle. The seats bear your weight admirably, despite their age, and the rustic scent of wood smoke and fine leather upholstery makes relaxation as effortless as breathing. Though you and Asterion are the only current occupants of the lounge, things seem a little livelier than the stark row of unclaimed stools would suggest. With the hotel's improving condition, each one brims over with potential for future patrons to serve. There's something about Firelight's ability to captivate the heart that harkens back to times immemorial. I love fire, candles, all that good stuff. It's just pretty. As though written into your bones by the struggles of your ancestors. 
The dancing shadows stir an impulse that your mind can only dimly direct. For a moment, Asterion's presence is so insubstantial that you feel alone with your thoughts. Out of the corner of your eye, you see his bovine brow crease, eyes slowly flickering back and forth between you and the fireplace. His mouth opens soundlessly for a moment, but closes just as quickly, as though the subtlest perturbation of the air would be enough to shatter the idyllic scene. In the soft light, Asterion's countenance grows soulful, and then cold and lucid. Perhaps as a quirk of his immortal body, he seems to sober up more quickly than you were expecting. His gaze finally settles on the fire, with the stone-faced focus of a trained guard. Alert, but betraying no further sign of his feelings. You cannot say how many hours you two have spent before the fireplace, looking with simple, rapt attention at the flame. Heedless of the passage of time, the greedy moment stretches on as long as the compulsions of your biology will allow it to. The feeling of your chin hitting your chest eventually jolts you from the quiet reverie. You didn't even notice you were starting to nod off. Isn't that how it always goes? You just sort of fall asleep. <laughs> Bleary-eyed, whether with inebriation or fatigue, you check your phone. It's almost midnight. Asterion furtively steals a glimpse at the clock on your smartphone's screen, but raises no comment about it. Curiosity waylaid by duty, he speaks at last. Aren't you confused by the phone? They didn't even have computers back in your day, let alone cell phones. Or are you just assuming it's magic? It is quite late, master. Would it please you if I prepared dinner before you retire for the night? This time I can cook you a proper meal. I'm gonna be honest, I'm like barely here. You can see no reason to refuse Asterion's offer. It'll be a miracle if I make it into my room. The walk back to your quarters is blessedly brief, and you quickly take a seat on the couch and make ready for your evening meal. While your miniature manservant prepares your dinner, there is little to do except lounge on the couch and savor the smells that waft from your private kitchen. You continue to lapse in and out of consciousness every so often, torn between the gnawing hunger in your belly and the sudden weight of your eyelids. Asterion presents you with your food in short order, bringing a tray of ham steak and mashed potatoes to the couch to spare you the need to walk to the table. To your tipsy, sleep-fogged brain, it seems a veritable feast. You tear into it with the gusto of a starving man. As you sit up and start to eat, Asterion seems faintly content to see you enjoying his cooking. But old habits die hard nonetheless. The Minotaur bows dutifully before cantering away to let you enjoy your meal in solitude. We'll get there eventually. We're gonna have dinner together, I promise. He's gone before you can think, you can think to ask him to join you. And though you know he is but a simple shout away, you think better of asking anything else of him. Once your hunger is sated, sleep is upon you in a moment. You set the dray down at the side of the couch and close your eyes. And much like when I come home every day from work, you just pass that on the couch. <laughs> the last sounds you hear are the faint clink of Asterion's hooves against the floor, and the jingling of silverware as he carries your leftovers back to the kitchen. A slow, sneaking clop reaches your semi-conscious brain through the haze of fitful sleep, followed by a sudden sensation of warmth and a gentle pressure across your entire body. You soon fall into a deeper, easier slumber. It's either a blanket or you carried me to bed. One of those two things. Ooh, we're back to Hades and the arrival. He's a good boy. The doorknob clicks beside us, behind Asterion. His smile persists as he holds on to the warmth from this night. The Minotaur's cheeks hurt from smiling. An unfamiliar sensation after the decades locked away. I mean, you didn't even have half a cheek. His throat, too, is sore from talking. Whatever he tries to say only comes as a raspy croak now. His recovering body surprises him at times. How it doesn't hurt to move anymore. How quick he is, even at a slow pace. This renewed strength surprises him. He had a difficult time handling the fragile glasses and small, delicate tools back in the lounge. Similarly, closing the door without slamming it behind him now, just now was tricky. And yet, now he is alone in his room. There is silence. And a silence like this, after any night when one's cheeks end up hurting from smiling, is as oppressive as being whisked away from paradise. Silence can be unforgivable. The master's voice and breathing, the slight shift in furniture as he moved around the room, the sounds of his own hoofsteps. It's all gone. 
There are no eyes watching him, nothing to say or do in this barren bedroom. He lays on his bed and looking up at the ceiling. The bedroom has no windows, just this single light bulb shining overhead. I can change that, you just have to ask me to. Asterion swishes his tail, the tuft of hair at its end provides him with a single sound. He clutches his pillow beneath his head, his fingers contort into shaking fists, and the light imprints a stain on his eyes. The corners of his healed mouth hurt. It's been decades since he smiled this much. Left alone, there are no distractions from dark thoughts. About that master, and all humans for that matter. Humanity is a sentence by itself, he thinks. To only be half human, and to be ruled over by those I'll never be like. The Minotaur wonders how large is the gap that keeps men from going wild. It is easy to show goodness at first, like Clement did, but eventually they grow bored. And bored men are dangerous indeed. How long will it take for this master to learn, the Minotaur wonders. It usually starts simple enough. At first he becomes their plaything, a doll. But it won't stop there. Humans seek new thrills often. I'm gonna be honest, when I'm bored, I am the least dangerous thing on my planet to everyone except for myself, because then I start, you know, der berating myself for not doing stuff. But, like, when I'm bored, I'm just getting mad at myself for not being able to do more, like, to make myself do more. I can guarantee I don't get, I don't hurt other people when I'm bored. <laughs> and I definitely don't want to seek new thrills in that manner. Clement was a special case, a man who started out good but went wild like none before. But yes, there were many masters who had that same seed in them, only it germinated slower. Even Master Jean-Marie had it to an extent. There was that time. Asterion jolts up, stopping himself from progressing down that road. There are thoughts too dark for such a late night for such a late hour. And what does it matter now, thinking about the well buried dead? His mind goes back to the current master. A single good night does not make up for a terrible past and a frightening future. Asterion thinks back to Argos and his contract, and how the master handled it. Master Rukari argued with the snake, tried contesting its terms. The Minotaur knows well the fine balance that comes to the masters. Someone too innocent may be tricked by the snake... But a lord too witty is dangerous in his own right. The hotel has great power, and it's a miracle even the most cruel masters only use it for their own hedonism as opposed to bringing harm to the world outside. The Minotaur keeps thinking himself to exhaustion, analyzing every possibility regarding this new master. He does not notice drowsiness setting in, nor sleep's merciful embrace. Ah, uh, it's going to take me literal years to prove to you that I am a decent person, and I am so sorry about that. The Minotaur dreams. A field of white flowers swayed under a chilly breeze. He was lying face down on the soil, and the flowers' stalks and leaves tickled his back, as if trying to rouse him from sleep. The soil was damp and smelled of petrichor and dense vegetation. Asterion caressed it, scratched it, felt the sand's water seeping into his fur. Everything hurt. With every heartbeat, his head and eyes were hammered. His whole body burned in exhaustion, dizzy and nauseous. But above all, his neck. It burned as if a searing hot metal wire strangled him. The Minotaur tried breathing, but it was as if his lungs couldn't pull in any air. It would have made him despair were it not for the overwhelming pain distracting him. Time passed, how long he could not tell. Asterion had only the soil, damp and aromatic, and the flowers swaying above him. He dug into the loamy ground. The coarse texture slipping around his fingers made the pain bearable. This is the moment after he died, I'm guessing. And then a chill ran from his skull down his spine to the tip of his tail. He breathed a lungful of air, and he could hear his own ragged grunts of relief. The Minotaur flicked his ears as his full senses returned. The swaying wind. He could hear it again now alongside the rustling leaves. He propped his chest up, supporting himself on his burning forearms, 
and taste came back to him. Iron. He coughed and cold, dark blood poured out of his mouth. It fell onto the white fur of his hand. His tongue remained coated in the black oil. It was bitter tasting, like a forge's fumes smelled. He knew this scent well. As he tried to gather himself, the blood dripped down into the soil. His fur remained matted with red while the dark oil dripped down. Cursed blood, he thought. But something else came to mind as well. The chill that brought him back. It was under his tongue. A hard, icy lump. He tried to spit it out to no avail. His inside lurched, and he lost control. He retched, but nothing would come out. It was another hour before he managed to stand up and see the horizon. There was no sky above, only sharp-edged rocks pointing down like knives. The horizon itself was painted with serpentine rivers, their waters crashing around and leaving foamy trails. The land was dark, and yet light seemed to seep from all surfaces. The ceiling stalactites shone with turquoise. The field of flowers blinked with white lights when the breeze blew by. The soil itself, itself shone with a subdued, almost royal purple, and the breeze had a freshness to it. The river's crashing waters filled the air with little droplets. Water dripped here and there from the ceiling with an almost lazy grace, like a god slipping gifts to the people below from above. A man waited by the river's shore, looking up to the Minotaur. He beckoned, and right there Asterion's mind was set at ease. This beautiful land was his mercy. The knot in his throat and the lump under his tongue would be the final pains he'd ever feel. He had been freed. The lump of cold ice was probably the coin they placed under his tongue to pay the ferryman's toll. I mean, assuming, assuming Theseus did that. That would have been nice of him. You wake up to the sound of Asterion's hooves clicking on the wooden floor right behind you. I mean, just, I'm just making assumptions, you know. But that, that sounds 100% like the fields of Asphodel. Good morning, master. I am sorry for the noise. It was not my intention to wake you. Snuggled up on the couch with a blanket covering you, it's easy to ignore the Minotaur's wards. Were it not for the sunlight shining directly on your eyes and the smell of breakfast, you would have fallen back asleep. You peel yourself away from your blanket's warmth. That's the hardest thing to do, is to get away from a warm blanket. You give Asterion a dopey smile as you step up and neatly fold the blanket before leaving it on the couch. I slept very well. Thank you, Asterion. Oh, that is a relief. Well, I went ahead and made breakfast for you. At times, it is easy to forget how exceptional are the circumstances you find yourself in. Waiting for breakfast is such a mundane thing, but all it takes is a glimpse of Asterion for the facade of normalcy to fall. It is easy to find Asterion's quick healing jarring, more so than the hotel itself. He already stretches the clothes that seemed too big yesterday. Speaking of his clothes, he is wearing the same old outfit from yesterday. One could say there is almost a touch of nostalgia to how he dresses, as if he wanted to hold on to the past. Or it may be a more practical matter, that this is the outfit you told him to wear. Say, Asterion. Yes, master? A about your clothes, is that all you have to wear? <sighs> yes, it's all I could find. I believe Clement threw away most threw most of my clothes away, much like how he disposed of the wine. All that is left is my current outfit. And um an old parazoma. You recall what a parazoma is from your classical art studies. It's no surprise that an that Asterion is an old fashioned guy and is wearing a 1500 BC style loincloth under his pants. Hmm? Well, you, you can't just wear the same old clothes every day and 70 year old clothes at that. Maybe you could try something more modern? We can just summon food and water here, right? Surely I can get you some clothes too. Of course, master. Just command and the hotel will bend to your will. Great, I can get you a whole fancy wardrobe. 
The hotel flickers around you as reality rewrites itself. You picture a shirt you can see yourself wearing. It's a simple task. Something stylish and fitting for a minotaur. Out of nowhere, a bundle appears in your hands. It's a pair of blue jeans and the v-neck you came up with. Asterion stares, visibly confused. Perhaps it is fitting that I have more modern clothes to wear. Today might be a special day. Now that the hearth is lit, guests may find their way to the hotel again. I want to make a good impression. Maybe the clothes I picked are inappropriate. I wouldn't know. It has been a long time, after all. What should I wear today, then? To dress a- I can dress him! Oh, this is- okay, I didn't think I would be able to dress him. To dress a Asterion, select one of- on one of the categories on the left side of the screen, and then select the clothes you want Asterion to wear on the right. When you're done, click the finish button. Okay. Clothes. That's an option. Let's just put you in something modern. Oh, the temptation is there. The temptation is there, but we're not gonna do it because we're responsible and this is a PG-13 Let's Play. But, you know what, I do, I do feel like Having something just a little bit more modern would probably help with the impression for newer folks. So, so let's go with the modern look. Asterion seems curious about his new clothes. He looks at the pattern on the shirt and runs his hands through the fabric of his blue jeans and adjusts his tail to peek through a hole below the belt. Hey, it's even got a tail hole. I've seen this fabric before. Let me think. I believe I saw it on a miner from America. He had lost his home after the Wall Street crash and found his way there. His pants seemed sturdier, despite being worn from work. Is this fabric common nowadays, Master? Yeah, very much. Pretty much everyone has at least one pair of jeans now. Now isn't that a funny turn of events? I remember those garments were looked down upon back then. It's always amusing when working-class clothes become fashionable even among aristocrats. I've seen it happen a few times. Asterion looks at the pattern on his shirt. Mm, Meandrus. Yeah, I found it fitting. Makes you look a little like a geometric pattern base. On second thought, I hope it doesn't bring up bad memories of staying in the labyrinth. <laughs> Not at all. Well, if I have any grudge with the symbol, it's that the Athenians made it popular. But I do find it comforting. Brings back memories. I appreciate it, Master. If we get guests today, I expect this won't look intimidating for them. You've made a fine choice, Master. Now that this matter is settled, I shall interrupt your breakfast no more, Master. You begin your meal. Asterion sits at the other end of the table, occasionally inspecting his appearance. When you look up from your plate, you catch him grooming his fur here and there. Once you are done, Asterion bows and takes your plate. Gonna get you to the pre gonna get the breakfast, lunch, dinner, one meal. I swear to God. As he carries them, as he carries it to the kitchen, you see him pick at some of the scraps and eat them. Hmm. Can I just summon a plate of fruit on the table for you? A short while later, he returns. Do I have the master's permission to go down and inspect the hearth? I want to make sure everything in the hotel is working properly. Yeah, sure, I can go with you. Really? Yeah, I mean, if we're having guests, maybe I should help with the inspections, see where everything is and all. Very well. Please, follow me. We're going together, buddy. I swear. Sooner or later, I'm gonna convince you. Kota 1, Journey to the West. This is an entirely new description, which I'm gonna guess is someone new who's probably coming to the hotel, which is great. But I think that's gonna be I think that's gonna be someone new we meet in the next episode. Cause this is I said I would make them longer, but even now this is getting a little bit long. Anyways. 
Thank you guys so much for watching. I know there was a little bit of a break in there where I dealt with life and work and stuff, but we're back on track. We'll finish games eventually, you know? Eventually. Right? I'm just, I'm, I'm just gonna go before I embarrass myself anymore, okay? Okay. <laughs> Goodbye!